Cradle from the Davenport House. And when I asked Jamie for a bio, she sent me like one line because she's so modest. And Jamie's way more accomplished than that. So I went and got her bio from her employer. So I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. So Jamie Cradle is the director of the Davenport House Museum, which is under Historic Savannah Foundation. She's been there since 2002. And her prior experience includes tenures at the Stan Highwood Hall and Gardens in Akron, Ohio, the McFadden Ward House in Bowman, Texas, the Cape Fear Museum in Wilmington, North Carolina, and Shadows on the Tesh in New Iberia, Louisiana. Her educational background includes internships at the Jekyll Island Museum, the museum at Stony Brook in New York, as well as professional development training with the Jekyll Island Management Program, the Seminar of Historic Administration with Colonial Williamsburg, the Victorian Society in America's Summer Program in Newport, Rhode Island, and the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, Summer Institute Chesapeake Region in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. She graduated from Salem College with a BA in English and the University of North Carolina at Greensboro with an MA in Public History. She's a past president of Coastal Museums Association, where I know her from, and a former board member of the Georgia Association of Museums and Galleries. In 2013, Jamie received the Museum Leadership Award from the Southeastern Museums Conference um, for showing significant advancement within the profession by leadership and museum activities at her institution and within the museum profession as a whole and especially in the Southeastern region. She's been on the faculty of the Jekyll Island Management Institute as a specialist in museum interpretation since 2010. So now that I've embarrassed her because she really is very accomplished and well respected within um, this region in the museum community, I'll introduce Jamie Cradle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, for coming out and, and having some lunch. Um, and I'm going to hand out um, some um, some brochures on uh, urban slavery. If you don't want it, don't take it because you know expensive. Um, but I'm going to hand those out and we pass those around, please, sir. Um, <coughs> Now what I'm going to talk about is a um, material from a special program that we do with Rhodes Scholars. Um, are you familiar with Rhodes Scholars? They're senior travelers, savvy people. They want um, deep learning and so um, we try to give them a little bit of something extra of a topic that they choose and they thought that we would be a good place to talk about urban slavery. Um, and the reason why we talk about um, well, we talk about the 1820s at the Davenport House. We're geeks. It's the geeks holiday. You good with that? Um, we, um, we interpret the museum house um, using an inventory taken at the time of Mr. Davenport's death in 1827. So he moved into the house in 1820 or so, and he died in 1827. So the 1820s are our uh, decade. And on uh, Mr. Davenport's inventory at the time of his death includes nine Negroes worth $2,150. So, um, so that is sort of the impetus for this program. And if you want to see our inventory, I'll pass that around if you like that kind of thing. Um, now, um, we call uh, what we do, uh, the house, a mechanics household. What do you think of when you think of a mechanic? somebody that works underneath the hood of a car. But um, in the 19th century, a mechanic was a skilled worker, a skilled builder. So just a little bit of background. Isaiah Davenport was from New England. Uh, we think he had a pretty difficult early life. His father died when he was one, so one would assume that. But somehow he was able to get an education. He apprenticed carpentry up in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, but when he finished his education, it was very similar to today. What happened? That's the prompt. What happened? Nothing happened. Couldn't get a job. Um, so he did like maybe some of your ancestors, some of my ancestors. What did he do? He left everything he knew behind and looked for opportunity in the port city of Savannah. He arrived here in his early 20s. And by the time he died at 43, uh, uh, every square had a house by, built by Isaiah Davenport. Now that's kind of an exaggeration. He built a lot of houses. Uh, his wife was pregnant with their tenth child and they'd acquired nine slaves. Uh, so people, life was very different back then. That's a story that we tell. And so he was called himself a mechanic. He was a skill builder. He worked with wood. He shaped the, the wood floors and the beams of the house. Um, but we would think more of him being a contractor. Um, he, would, he, um, he didn't just um, 
work with Wood, he, he acquired uh, skill builders to help him build houses. So that's why we call it a mechanics household. We don't call it a family, we call it a household because that involved everybody that lived within the house. Now, when I, I, she read a whole bunch of stuff about me and it just means that I'm old. And, um, and so when I was in school, we didn't get a great deal of history of African Americans in America. Um, so I'm going to give, this is sort of a general uh, idea of, of African Americans in Savannah, but of course we need to think about um, the, um, the period of the African diaspora, you might have seen this before. Um, the en enslavement of Africans took place over a 400 year period. Um, so um, from around 15, uh, 8, 1518 to 1850. And, and slaves were uh, gotten from West Africa and came over here. So the, the part about Savannah is very, very small. The part about America is very, very small. About 500,000 enslaved Africans came to the North American continent, to, um, to the United States, or the, North, um, the, uh, the 13 colonies. Um, about 5% of all those, what is it, 11 million people? It's a very, very large story. It encompasses so much. And if you want to learn more about that, you need to see another program, because we're going to talk about Savannah. Now, the one thing that we did talk about when I was in school, I'm sure you've heard this term, the triangle of trade. You remember that? You think, what is that? Okay. Um, so, um, in the new world, we had raw materials that were shipped over to the old world to be made into manufactured goods. And then you get the trade winds coming south to the to, to that the border of the African continent, picking up slaves there. And then this is the dreaded Middle Passage coming back. So that's when we talk about um, the Triangle of Trade. That's sort of a, in a simplistic uh, way um, what that means. Now I work in the uh, tourism business, and one of the first questions people say is, "Well, I didn't think that Oglethorpe had slaves, um, and I didn't think y'all had slaves in Georgia." Um, well, um, uh, uh, Mr. Oglethorpe, General Oglethorpe, uh, did not want uh, slaves in the colony of Georgia. Uh, he felt that they contributed to the idleness and luxury of the colonist. But he did borrow some slaves uh, to lay out the city and to build the fortification. Um, and one of the things that we talk about in the early 19th century, one of the things that sets us apart from the rest of the, um, the North American colonies is that um, this planned city. So just know the hands that laid out that city um, were black. Um, and that's our, our planned city right there. Now, um, we um, ceased to be a, a, um, a, a social experiment in 1751 and became a royal colony, and of course with that came slavery. So it was only a short period that slaves were not allowed in the colony of Georgia. Uh, and so Savannah became um, the important entry point for slaves in the colony of Georgia after 1751. And I didn't do, do this, you know, um, this what I'm telling you is not divine revelation. Um, and there are some books that you could read that you could get this information from. And this book was written in 1964, a long time ago. But it is still a very good book about um, slaves and cities. So I'm um, in this by um, Richard Wade, Slavery and Cities. And of course, the dean of, of Georgia uh, slavery writing is a lady named Betty Wood. Love all of her books. Um, uh, Whittington Johnson wrote Black Savannah. And then, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with the Telfair Museum uh, recently put out this book on, um, on slavery and freedom in Savannah. So if you want to read more, um, uh, they're easy to come by. Now, in the uh, 18th century, uh, People, people in the slave trade, they, there wasn't any social stigma. People didn't sort of hide the fact that that was what they did for a living. Because you see a, one of our well-known families here in this ad, um, uh, Kelper and Telfair, um, but they might say they were in the, the Guinea trade or the Africa trade, um, but they were, they, it wasn't something that you would hide from. Um, now, in our business, people, when they're seeking information about Savannah, some people travel to, uh, to be exposed to Gullah and Geechee culture. And I think that you know that um, slaves were acquired from the continent of Africa because of their abilities to, help me, cultivate rice. Um, and so we got rice growing all around um, us. So the cultivation of rice um, and um, but the game changer with regard to Savannah and to agriculture in our part of the world was 
short staple cotton. Cotton King, you ever felt short staple cotton? Tactile experience here. Um, don't plant the, uh, the seeds. Try to see, see if you can get um, the seeds out. Now I got this from my uh, little hometown in Eastern North Carolina. And um, so, so y'all see to get the seeds out, y'all gotta play. But they don't want you to plant that in your yard because of the boll weevil. Don't wanna, don't wanna perpetuate the boll weevil here. So um, this is called short staple cotton. Here, and you can cut, uh, cut, uh, pull it in half and y'all can share. Um, now we did grow Sea Island cotton at Wormslow. It made uh, uh, cloth that was like silk, um, but it didn't grow everywhere. You can, anybody got the seed out? Give me somebody, y'all aren't playing, y'all sophisticated people here. Get the seed out, here we go, here we go, thanks. Now, what you can do with short staple cotton um, is you can drop the seed on the ground pretty much. You might be able to drop it here and it would, it would grow. Um, it's, um, it's, it's not real um, choicey about where it grows. So that was, um, cotton became king with the um, advent of short staple cotton. But the problem uh, was, of course, getting the seeds out. And you can ask a child in the fourth grade around the world. This international event happened very close to here, and of course you know what that is, right? Eli Whitney and the cotton gin. Now, I got into an argument this weekend about whether Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin or whether he patented the cotton gin, that's neither here nor there. A big deal happened about 10 miles from here um, with Eli Whitney and the cotton gin. And his machine sort of combed the, uh, the fibers and got the seeds out, um, ginning out that cotton. And so that made the production of cotton um, advantageous to people um, in the entire South, except it took a lot of people to harvest. Um, cotton, and this is what it looks like growing in the field, short staple cotton, um, people harvesting cotton. Now, um, if you, um, if you felt, found the bowls here, that would hurt, picking that all day. Um, now, uh, how much cotton do you think a, a, a prime slave could pick a day, or was supposed to pick a day? compelled to pick a day. It was probably about 100 pounds, 70 to 100 pounds. That's a lot of cotton, yeah. Thinking about it in the hot sun and, um, and then the, sticking your hand in there with these sharp, um, so it was a very, very laborious, stooped over, harsh existence. Uh, you can find anything on the internet, fantastic pictures, not fantastic, but illustrative pictures of children that would have harvested cotton. Um, now, for most of us, or most people, when they come to Savannah, or just in general, they think of slavery in America, they think of agricultural workers who lived on plantations in quarters, um, and, they, um, and they worked in agriculture, of course. Now, in our part of the world, the people that worked in agriculture worked in a system called the task system. I'm sure you've heard of that, right? Um, well, the other system was the gang system where you'd work just all day from can to can't, as they say, out in the field and you're just, you just all the time. Uh, there were periods off, but for general, all the time. But in, in our part of the world, the low country, there was the task system. You heard of that, that for sure? Where you, if you had a job and you completed your job, your time was your own. Now this doesn't mean that they had a nine to five job, um, but there may have been some time allowed them and you didn't work on Sundays. So what that meant was that if you had the ability to, um, to move after all that work, you could jump into the economic system and you could improve your lot in some way. Because you got a very meager um, amount of food, maybe a peck of corn a week, and your clothing allowance was pretty meager, uh, maybe a pair of pants and a shirt a year, maybe one pair of shoes. So if you wanted to improve your lot, you would go fishing, you would plant your garden plot, you'd get a, a chicken and you'd uh, sell the eggs, that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, this is what a, a quarters would look like just across the water in South Carolina. Um, and the task, so that's an important thing to know about our particular area is the task system. But we aren't on the plantation. Uh, city life had a pace and a sophistication that was very different from rural life. Um, 
And of course, one of the differences is, um, of course, living in the city, you've got um, contact with people of all races and religions uh, do, going around Savannah doing business. And I'm going to pass this around because this is a, um, a, um, a map that we have at the Davenport House, which is very similar to this. Now, looking on this map, um, and I got, I got this sophisticated little pointer here. Do you see anything that sort of relates to anything we've talked about with regard to slavery? Well, both sides of the city, rice fields. Coming up the Savannah River, ships maybe coming to Ellis Square or to Johnson Square to the slave market. Negro burying ground. I, I'm not sure if that might be Whitfield Square, near Whitfield Square today. Um, now, the jail. Um, city masters didn't usually punish their slaves on their property. They sent them to the jail housekeeper to do that. Um, and of course, if you know anything about Savannah, you know that some slaves lived out, many of them in Yamacraw or over in the old fort section. And of course, we're made up of streets and lanes. So you want to remember the lanes as we're looking at this stuff. Now, our time period, the early 19th century, the city population was about 40% African American. And the squares and, uh, were, and wards were pretty well integrated. That didn't mean that people got along. It meant that the white population did not want uh, the development of a cohesive black community. Um, now, I don't, have you ever heard of this guy, Charles Colcock Jones? Um, he was the author of a whole bunch of papers that were compiled into a groundbreaking book about 25 years ago called Children of Pride. So if you're a geek, you can go to the library and look that up. It's all of their family writings with regard to plant, a plantation, I believe, down in Midway area. But he was a Presbyterian minister, and he wrote religious tracts to instruct people, including slaves, on how to behave. And, um, and he came up with this categorization um, in the 1830s and 40s of the slaves or the African Americans living in Savannah. And so he says that you got your, your um, family servants, and then you might own some servants that you hired out. And then there are nominal slaves. Now, this is something that people have never heard of. Uh, these are people that paid their masters either by the month of the year, and then they lived out somewhere, and they worked on their own in Savannah. And then we've got um, the people that knew the waterways, the creeks, um, this area that were watermen, navigate sh uh, ships um, up the river. Now, uh, Whittington Johnson in his book, Black Savannah, categorized the types of jobs that both um, African Americans, both men and women, had in Savannah during the period before the Civil War. So some of the stuff I've talked about, Drayman, you know what that is? a man that uh, drove a wagon with a cotton bale down to the waterfront, um, a, 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 um, a heavy, he would be like um, a truck driver today. Um, and then we've got stevedores or longshoremen types, and then we've got the watermen, and then women, washerwomen, seamstress, cook, and all the way down to sellers of small wares. Now, there was a small but important population of free people of color. Um, but that designation was kind of a misnomer because you weren't free. Um, you had to wear a badge. You had to have a white sponsor. Um, you had to adhere to a curfew. And for the men, you had, there was compulsory um, city municipal service. Um, you might be, have to be involved with the, um, the fire department or cleaning the streets. Um, it's just, it, it was, it, we get calls a lot of times from people that want to work off their um, DWI points at the Davenport House because they think it would be easy. Um, but that's not ki that kind of work. It would have been very difficult um, work um, at that time period. And after um, 1818, by the way, um, masters were not allowed to free their slaves um, in this particular part of the world. Now, um, Luchan and I were just talking about this. Um, these are, these are the types of badges we believe they wore. And if you see one of these on eBay for $30, buy it. 
it's a fake. <laughs> no, because um, these are very, very rare, um, and it looks real. Um, but this is the kind of thing that, that enslaved people um, or free people of color would have to wear to denote that they could walk around the city um, before the curfew. Now, I would assume that it would be somehow attached to their clothing. don't think they had um, uh, uh, pins to do that. Um, safety pins. Now, um, one of the things about us urban areas, we're a port city, sailors coming in, um, all kinds of t types of people that made urban life very different from plantation life. And of course, cotton going out to a broader world. Couldn't find a picture of Savannah, so what city is this? New Orleans, anyway, but it, same thing. <laughs> uh, and this is a drayman uh, taking his load down to the waterfront. This is after the Civil War, but still cotton um, being waiting, waiting to be loaded onto a ship to take out someplace else. Actually, that looks like um, railroad cars, but bales down the waterfront. Um, this is what a stevedore looked like, and um, this is another product that would have been shipped out of the port. Naval stores, the product, product of the pine tree, tar pitch of turpentine. Another thing about us that we are still this way in Savannah, because it's a lot, you know, we're, when you're driving from, uh, from uh, uh, Macon, you think they've moved Savannah. There's nothing around it. Uh, we are still a commercial center with not a lot around us. So people come to the mall here. Well, people would come from the countryside to the market to buy food. So these are fantastic pictures of a city market um, uh, when it was um, busy, busy, busy. And this is one of the things that I found amazingly fantastic, because I hadn't done a lot of reading until we did this program. Almost the whole of the purchasing and selling of edible articles for domestic consumption was transacted by colored persons. Now this is from Mr. Wade's book, and the terminology is a bit different than we use today. But just think about all of these houses, the Davenport House, the Owens Thomas House, the Andrew Lowe House. The food wasn't just prepared by African-Americans, it was grown or killed by African-Americans. Um, so um, when you're thinking about that fine dining, remember who prepared it. Um, and so this is a picture just after the Civil War of a um, of, of plantation slave or newly freed people walking in from the countryside here in Savannah to the market to get into the economic system, make some money um, from the things that they have grown selling things at the market. Now, uh, for us at the Davenport House, this is most of the enslaved people in Savannah were domestics. Every bit of work around the household was done by domestic slaves or bonds people is what Betty Woods calls um, enslaved people. Every bit, washing, baking, uh, gardening. And of course, you would entrust your most precious to your enslaved people. And of course, we know that, uh, that um, the food that we know of as Southern cooking was prepared by black hands, by fierce people in that hot, hot uh, um, kitchen, preparing the food under the direction of the mistress of the household. But we never talk about Southern laundry. It was pretty arduous to do laundry. Um, and this is what the kettles and that kind of thing, uh, barrels in these beautiful side gardens today would have been filled with um, a very arduous task that was never ending. Now, um, I, you might be familiar with this fellow up here. His name is Joe McGill, and he's made it his personal mission to go and sleep at every extant slave quarters left in America. And he, came, he did a, a conference on, um, on um, slave dwellings a couple years ago, and he is seated, seated, seated at what looks like a, a place for an enslaved person to lay their head at night. There weren't a lot of personal possessions. It's like, I'm not going to go to my room. You'd be lucky if you had a pallet and a blanket or something that would look like this. Um, and most slaves lived with their owner, enslaved people. But um, there is a quote in this book here about a gentleman in the 1840s going to the Marshall House. And he got up in the night to do something. And, uh, and he had to step over the porters. They were laying spoon fashion in the hall with neither bed nor bedding. So that wasn't atypical, um, not to have bedding. So when you see these fancy urban slave quarters like at Owens Thomas House or the Bellamy Mansion in Wilmington, North Carolina, those were the exception 
as opposed to the norm, big old fancy house with a big uh, separate slaves' quarters. Now, um, for our tourists, I think, uh, and for me too, you love to walk around the historic district and peep in the, those gates and see those beautiful gardens. In the 19th century, those were primarily utilitarian yards that sort of encapsulated the lives of the enslaved people. Um, so they were a, a masonry barrier. And no matter where you lived, uh, if you were an enslaved person, your life was cramped, crude, and uncomfortable. Uh, and you know, I, this is a, a lame analogy, uh, but I still have bad dreams about college room assignments. <laughs> Who am I going to get? Where am I going to be? Well, think about the tension in the, in the, uh, amongst the enslaved people. Who was going to get what job? Who was going to get a place, a good place to sleep, and who wouldn't? Who would have gotten better food? There must have been a lot of tension within the household um, of enslaved people. And of course, we all love to go into our room and shut the door, but there was a total and complete lack of privacy um, during the time of enslavement. Now, you know, there are lots of laws on the books, but only in an emergency were they rigidly enforced. But you just never knew when that would be. Um, now, um, one of the things um, that makes us different in Savannah is the fact that we are laid out in wards with streets and lanes. So the looseness with regard to urban slavery in Savannah goes back to our, uh, our city plan and the fact that somebody could slip, slip out the shed down the lane into a broader world. So the lanes were the communication route for the African American community. Now, some people um, uh, decided to vote with their feet. Uh, and so you will see, or I don't know if any of you are geeks, and you, you, um, you can get access to historic newspapers online, and you can spend all day looking at newspapers from the 1820s. Y'all like to do that? I can tell. Um, but um, so um, we had an intern and to, to look in the 1820s, and this is just voluminous amount of advertisements for runaway slaves. Some of them from Savannah and some of them coming to Savannah to get out. Um, so just be aware that lots of transients in Savannah. Now people ask us, uh, I will say, well, was Mr. Davenport good to his slaves? And of course that's a kind of a silly question. <laughs> they were enslaved people. So this is a quote from the time period from Mr. Wade's book. A lenient owner might permit a wider freedom, but in so doing he invited the intervention of local authorities. That meant people are watching you. Uh, if the masters of families do not check the impudence and abandon their dependents, as the band observer advised, it is time for the city marshal and constable to make, take the matter into hand. So you've, you've got to do what your neighbors are doing if you want to live in our city. Now, this is too much for you to read, but this sort of gives you an idea about the laws on the books with regard to enslaved people and their movement in Savannah. And it's kind of interesting. Most of the slave codes happened before we were even America. And they controlled many, many aspects of life. Dog ownership, drinking, smoking in public, um, uh, the jobs that you had. Um, but again, only rigidly enforced um, when, when an emergency happened. But you know, this is, this is hard stuff though. The lash and punishment was an integral part of uh, slave life. And um, few adults could expect to, ex uh, uh, to escape corporal punishment altogether. Now, th uh, this is not a Savannah picture, but I'm sure something like that probably happened here. It's a very famous um, after the Civil War picture of someone showing the scars of a beating. And of course, you, the beatings weren't the worst thing. The worst thing, the things that you were most scared about were being sold away from the people that you love and everything that you know. In fact, one of the worst things that could happen was for your master to die. Because then you, who knows what your fate would be. Um, so this is, um, uh, and we had a very active uh, uh, city uh, slave market here in Savannah. A slave could expect to be sold at least once in his lifetime, and for urban blacks the chances were much higher, yet the possibility of staying with one master was never strong. Now, one of the things that sets Savannah apart from other places is the antebellum black church. 
Now, whites felt like it perpetuated the system, and I think that African Americans thought something else. Um, but, um, and there were integrated churches. The Presbyterian Church and the Catholic Church were integrated. That didn't mean that they liked to sit together. The blacks usually sit up in the gallery. But that was the exception as opposed to the norm. Um, in fact, now, I, it's my understanding. We had, we had a lady from Colonial Williamsburg um, that was at the Davenport House this past weekend that said, no, that's the, there. I think that uh, our first African Baptist church is the oldest, uh, only church in America built by slaves before the Civil War. That's, that's my belief. Um, and so right there on Franklin Square, and this is what the church looked like before the new building. Uh, but there were two reasons why the black church was able to survive in Savannah. Well, for one thing, the blacks allowed it, and the other thing is the blacks went to it. I mean, this isn't rocket science here. Uh, now, a few things happened in the 1820s. Again, if you're a geek, you, you've heard of these things. Um, one of those was Denmark Vesey's uprising. Now, have you heard of Denmark Vesey? Um, recently, he's been in the news because of um, his work in founding uh, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston. Um, but Denmark Vesey was an interesting fellow. He uh, bought his freedom having won the lottery in Charleston. And um, supposedly, he instigated an uprising, which was thwarted. But then he was arrested, and a whole lot of other people were. They were, they were going to be an armed uprising. They were going to plan to seek their freedom. He already had his freedom. He wanted his brothers to have their freedom as well. He was caught, and, and the trial was blow by blow in the newspaper in Savannah. Uh, and, of course, uh, they had public hanging, I think, for 30 people over in, in Charleston, if you can imagine. Um, but it was written up. You could, you could read it in the newspaper. So that must have made the white folk a bit anxious and uneasy. Um, and, um, and of course, the, uh, the villains written up in the newspaper for um, the Denmark Vesey uprising were considered the domestics in the households of Charleston. Why would that be? Well, they knew your every movement. And so they could help plan uh, an uprising with their fellows. Um, Another thing that with regard to slavery during the 1820s was the visit of, the, of General Lafayette. Now, he was the oldest surviving, or the only surviving general of the Revolution alive in the 1820s, and America invited him back, and he came and he took a, a tour of all 24 states. Um, but one of the things that he was very disturbed about was the proliferation of slavery in the southern, uh, southern states. Uh, he, he went and told um, James Madison that if he had known that that would happen, he might not have, uh, have expended his resources in the fight for our freedom. And another publication that came out at the end of the 1820s was a publication by a man named David Walker, David Walker's Appeal. He was born in Wilmington, North Carolina, a slave. I believe he was a slave. Anyway, he found his way up to uh, Boston. He wrote a pamphlet um, and sent it everywhere that he could, and some pamphlets got to Savannah. Uh, the story is that Henry Cunningham, the preacher of Second African, found pamphlets, and instead of distributing those, he gave those to the authority, because if he had been caught with those, we might have had a mass hanging in Savannah too. But, um, but people knew about this, or else we wouldn't know about it today. So that, uh, how are we doing time? So that is sort of a general idea um, that we give our Rhodes Scholars about uh, slavery in Savannah. And right for just the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about what we know about the mechanics household in the 1820s, Isaiah Davenport. Mr. Davenport is not George Washington. We don't have a voluminous amount of information about him. We have the same sort of records about him that they have about you. Uh, we have tax records, deed books, um, census records, and of course we have, which you might not have, but you might have a record of all your possessions. This is the inventory taken at Mr. Davenport's death. So that is what we use to interpret urban slavery at the Davenport house. Um, now this is from the Tax Digest. So Mr. Davenport got married in 1809, and shortly thereafter, even though he's from New England, he starts acquiring slaves. And you're not supposed to jump to an assumption, but you kind of do, uh, that maybe these are household slaves. And so these are the dates 
I'm assuming this in the middle is the, is the page number and the deed book. That's my assumption. And then these are the slaves, the number of slaves that Mr. Davenport owned. So you can see that his prosperity is sort of proliferating as time passed um, and as his family grew. So, and by the time of his death, uh, uh, nine or ten slaves. So, you know, it's a terrible thing to uh, contemplate, but buying a slave was like buying a car. You could go to the dealership, you could go to the auction, or you could have private sales. Most of the slaves that we think, no, that Mr. Davenport owned, we think were private sales. Um, and so you can see up at the top, uh, he acquired um, a young man named Tom. But the one, um, this one here, um, that he bought, uh, this category here, from David Baldwin, is the one that we pay the most attention to. Mr. Davenport has bought a family of enslaved people. He bought Bella, who was 28, and her four children. Jack, who was nine, twin boys, Isaac and Jacob, uh, and they were five, and then a little girl named Polly, who's one year old. He also bought a yellow woman named Mary, a mulatto person. And then this is Susanna Clark is his mother-in-law. So he's bought, uh, he bought Deeping and Mary and Ann from his mother-in-law. So that's sort of what we know about Mr. Davenport. Now, another thing, I find this uh, mildly amusing. Uh, Mr. Davenport was a member of city council. Um, his peers uh, elected him. The mechanics wanted him to represent them at the city council. And so he uh, had a, a, a platform of things that he believed in he was going to advocate. And one of those things was um, blue laws. We're still talking about blue laws. Um, and so he said, we presented the evil of greatest magnitude, the effect produced by tippling shops being kept open on the Sabbath day to encourage the habits of intoxication among Negroes and other persons. Nothing's changed. Everybody's getting drunk on Sunday afternoon. Stop that. So tippling shops are bars. Um, and he, he doesn't want that. And so that is a, a plank in his platform. Now, these are the things that are very difficult to read, but they're filled with information. Mr. Davenport's slave named Nancy ran away. Uh, she was acquired in January, I think, um, 1812, and she's in the newspaper about a year later, having run away. $50 reward. Ran away from subscriber Isaiah Davenport, owner about the 20th of March last. So she left like two months after she was acquired here. Uh, a Negro wench named Nancy, about 30 years of age, 4 foot 10 inches high, has a scar on her neck. She can speak the German language. Nancy was formerly the property of George Rents, who owns her sister by the name of Peggy. They look very much alike. They can only be distinguished by the scar Nancy has on her neck. She has been seen several times passing from Savannah to Wilmington Island. And Mr. Davenport wants her back. Filled with information, physical descriptions, um, the fact that she can speak German. Um, I think Mr. Rents probably spoke German. And she's got a sister named Peggy. Fascinating stuff. And we recently found this one. Another runaway slave ad for a guy named Davy. He was a skilled guy. Mr. Davenport inherited Davy from his brother Samuel, who passed away. And I guess Davy didn't like it, so he went away. But he was a wagoner. Davy. Now, during the time of Denmark Vesey's uprising, Isaiah Davenport was on the city council. And during that time, they were making tighter and tighter laws with regard to slaves and slave codes. And so one of the things that they were sort of restricting was jobs that African-American men could have. So they were, they were, no Negro could apprentice to be a carpenter, mason, bricklayer, barber, or any other mechanical art of mystery. And then later, you couldn't be a cabinet maker, painter, a blacksmith, tailor, cooper. Now, Mr. Davenport owns some skilled builders. Did you see that? Did I show you that? Let me go back. He owns some mechanics here. So it's a very complicated system here. So he's on the city council. They're, they're, not, they're restricting apprenticeships, but he already owned people who could do those uh, jobs. Now, Mr. Davenport died at the age of 43, leaving his wife a widow. And so how are you going to make some money for your, all of those young'uns you have? Well, you could hire out your enslaved people. So this is information about, and remember, they must have gotten Mr. Davy back, because there's David right here. $12 a month, and of course you recognize names, 
there's Isaac, there's little Polly, there's Jacob. So she has enslaved people that she's deriving income from. Now this is the one that's the hardest to take. This is all about business and money and property. Mrs. Davenport at this time period is 40 years old. She's got seven children and a house and so she needs income. So she is selling some of her property, lot number 14 on Columbia Ward. And you recognize the names? There's Davy. There's that whole family, Bella, Peggy, Bella, Jake, Isaac, Jacob, and Polly. And then there's Nancy. What's the deal with Peggy? Did Mr. Davenport acquire Peggy? I don't know. It's fascinating. Anyway, we don't know if that's, I'm sure either he got two other slaves named Peggy and Nancy, or that's Nancy that ran away and her sister Peggy. It's kind of fast. Now, we, at one point, we thought, well, this is the end of the story. This is one of those terrible stories, these families being torn apart. Uh, but we recently had some folks do some census research, and they found in 1830, oh, and I spelled that word wrong, sorry. <laughs> I can't spell. Um, but in 1830, Mrs. Davenport had 12 slaves. So, you know, one would hope that, the, that these people were not sold away from the home that they knew. Um, so this is 1828, and census shows that she had 12 slaves. So, you know, more research can be done, but that's uh, what we believe now. Um, but as you know, this is a very uh, rough subject, but we've lived through the story, and we know that culture survive. And so we know that um, there were some things that the African-American community was very proud of. Um, uh, um, fire. This is pre-Civil War firemen. Savannah had a pre, uh, the, the, the white folk managed the fire department, but it was actually the free people of color and enslaved people who actually put out the fire and they would get money if they got to the fire first, a source of pride. And of course, we know about food and music and dancing that survived. And some of the things that are very important to us as historians is that some people live to tell the story. There are slave narratives that we can fill in the blanks. And one of those people is a guy named Charles Ball. He ran away um, and he wrote a narrative in 1827 seven and um, and he came to Savannah and one of the things that he wrote that in the south there every man every woman too except prevented by poverty is a slave hold and the entire white population is leagued together by a common bond of the most sordid interest in the torture and oppression of the poor descendants of Africa so that's his truth now when we're talking about slavery uh, and the Davenports, all the things that, um, that we talked about in generality, we have a specific example. Mr. Davenport was an alderman during Denmark Vesey's uprising. He had runaways, he bought a mulatto, he bought and sold slaves, he had an enclosure. Um, the quarters are pretty tight. So, uh, so you know, we, we think that our example is useful to people to understanding our past. Um, and we recently, this past weekend, had a group of scholars come to Savannah, and we hope to reinterpret some of our property so that it's not just dependent on a brochure or a docent to be able to tell that story, but that we have an interactive exhibit um, that will help people understand this important part of our culture, because we have to understand it in order to move forward, I think. Anyway, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Y'all got any questions? I've got one question. Yes, sir. Uh, we talked about, talk about hiring out slaves. And I know in, in other situations in Savannah, if a slave got hired out, they got a portion of that money uh, back themselves. Was this the case in, in, in these hired out slaves in the urban area? We, we, uh, are you asking in general and specific with regard to the Davenports? Or? Yes. Like, I like this so the slaves in Savannah would, would like blacksmith would get hired out for $20 and the slave would get $2. For that I, I, I believe that is to be the case generally, but as far as specifically about the Davenports, I have, that's not something that we can't know. Okay. We could know if we have more documentation. If somebody dropped a book with all that written <laughs> down in there. Anybody else have any questions? I want to follow up with a couple of comments about resources Jamie mentioned. Um, we have most of the books that she's pointed out in the um, city's research library. So for city employees, you can check those out. So if you're interested in any of those books, just send me an email. 
Um, the free persons of color registers are in the city's collections, so you can um, come and research those if you're interested. They are fascinating. And again, she mentioned that um, while they are free persons, there are a lot of restrictions on the free persons of color, and in no way should we consider that those persons were really free in this community. And those books have a lot of information because they include where the, the, the people, who their family members were, where they were natives of, of, so where they were born, where they lived, what their occupations were, so if they were a seamstress or a bricklayer, and then who their white guardian or patron was. Um, Lacey Brooks, who works with us in the Library and Archives, a couple of years ago did a municipal slavery project, which is available on our website, and it was looking at how the city used enslaved people to support municipal work. And um, we, she looked at the financial records of the city um, to explore that, and we looked at our ownership of enslaved people, but one avenue we didn't look at was how we hired out, but there is evidence that we also use the hiring out process to um, hire out slaves of slave owners in the city. So we own slaves, but we also use um, possibly Sarah Davenport slaves as well to support municipal work. Um, the um, Savannah City Code, yes, Nancy. Yeah. Um, quick question, were the firefighters working for the city as? So um, uh, I was just actually, let me do okay. this and I'll get back and answer that question. The city codes, um, one of the city codes was that um, slaves and free persons of color had to perform fire service. So it was a local law, and so um, we there and there it written in that code was you know how much you would get paid for different things. So that was a law that um, Jamie referenced, and I was about to mention that our very earliest published code from 1854 is available on the city's website. And you can keyword search it for the word slave or Negro, because that was the word that was commonly used at that time, and see all of the codes or local ordinance, ordinances that were on the books at that time that would impact slaves or free persons of color in any way. So all, you can see all the restrictions that would have impeded your freedom at this time if you were an African-American. And then um, Jamie also referenced the Tax Digest. That was another city record. Basically, it was um, documenting your property at that year um, so that the city knew what to collect taxes on. So it was looking at all your personal property, so real estate, um, horses, um, slaves, anything that we could tax you on. And so those, we have the original volumes, they've also been microfilmed in the microfilm at the Full Street Public Library, and they're on Ancestry.com. So they're a wealth of information, not just for um, slaves, but just for whatever somebody might have had in their household. And a lot of the house museums have been using that to research um, the families that lived in their households. So I want to thank Jamie, and I've got we've got a little uh, token of appreciation from the from the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's got some pictures. I'm sure she'd be happy to let anybody who wants to look at the books come up too.